motion on UK membership of the European Economic Area. Mr Stephen Kinnock to move the motion. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I'd first like to thank the Backbench Business Committee for granting today's debate. And I'd also like to thank honourable and right honourable members on all sides of the House for supporting this application today. I'd in particular like to thank the honourable members for Lewisham East and Broxtow for co-sponsoring. Madam Deputy Speaker, if the referendum result was indeed a vote to take back control, then this House must surely have its say on this critically important issue. And so I rise today to commend this motion to the House, because all options for both the transition and the comprehensive trade and partnership deals must be on the table. But first I'd like to set this debate in context by outlining what the EEA is and what it is not, explaining how EEA membership can square the circle between market access, sovereignty and control, and illustrating how EEA membership offers a sensible and workable transition out of the European Union, a bridge rather than the potentially catastrophic cliff edge of exiting on WTO terms. So first, what is the EEA? Simply put, it's an internal market between the EU28 and Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein. It was set up in 1993 to allow the participation of non-EU states in the single market. But the EEA internal market excludes single market features such as fisheries and agriculture and does not entail membership of the customs union. This means that EEA members are able to negotiate trade deals with third countries, either bilaterally or through the European Free Trade Association. That's how Iceland became the first European country to strike a bilateral trade deal with China in 2011. And it is through EFTA membership in conjunction with the EEA that unfettered trade in goods is achieved. EEA EFTA membership could therefore provide a solid basis upon which to sustain frictionless trade between the UK and the Republic of Ireland post Brexit. Indeed, I will give you. To the honourable gentleman, he's just talked about a catastrophic cliff edge, and clearly it is in the interest of our country that we have a free trade deal. But will he use his remarks to put this into context? Exports in 2016 accounted 28% of our GDP, and the EU exports for 12.6%. Last month, the World Bank published a study showing that in the event of no deal and WTO rules, British trade in the EU might fall by 2%. That's 2% of a 12.6% or a quarter of 1% of our overall GDP. So when he talks about a catastrophic cliff edge, let him put it into context. I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his intervention. Could I suggest the Honourable Gentleman may wish to take a trip to the Port of Dover? Uh, the Brexit Select Committee uh, visited recently. I have the honour of being a member of that committee. And we were told that an additional two minutes of processing time on the 10,000 HGVs that go through that port would result in a 13-mile tailback. A WTO Brexit, we were told, would add a lot more than two minutes. And so I think we have to put this in the context of the institutional capacity of our country to cope with the WTO Brexit, uh, which is absolutely critical. On the question of exports in the EU, the West Midlands relies a lot on exports. You've got Jagged Land Rover and a number of other companies there. If we don't get this right, it will affect them pretty badly. I thank my honourable friend for that intervention and agree absolutely. In terms of the automotive sector, we know that uh, it's 10 per cent on every uh, car that we would wish to export to the EU in the case of a WTO based Brexit. And what's more, with the complex integrated supply chains that the automotive industry relies on, you're looking at tariffs and tariff, non-tariff barriers on every component that crosses the borders. So the, the, the result would indeed be catastrophic. Uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take one more intervention. I, I will take you late, uh, the Honourable Gentleman later. I'm very grateful to my Honourable Friend. Has he seen the recent forecast that a WTO-based Brexit would cost the UK economy 75,000 jobs in the financial services sector alone. Isn't he absolutely right to talk about the very grave dangers that that would pose to the British economy? I thank my honourable friend and, and agree that the financial services sector is indeed critical here because, of course, passporting is required. There is no passporting arrangements within a WTO deal, and so the impact would, in fact, be catastrophic. Uh, and, and remembering that the financial services sector is not just about the City of London. It's a million jobs across the entire United Kingdom, Edinburgh, Leeds, etc. 
to my giveaway. Um, would the honourable gentleman agree that it's not simply about lorries queuing, it's also about, for example, shell fisheries? You would have lobsters <laughs> sitting for days in tanks that actually they would be unsellable at the other end. And indeed, during our trip to uh, Dover, we were informed about the, the impact in, in terms of rotting food and vegetables on the border. So there's some very practical, tangible impacts here that we must bear in mind when it comes to a no-deal Brexit. I, I will make some progress now. Indeed, the head of the EFTA court, Karl Baudenbacher, has been a vocal advocate of the UK joining EFTA permanently, or at least as a short-term docking measure, an idea that the president of the European Court of Justice, Cohen Lennartz, has similarly advocated over the summer. EEA EFTA membership is emphatically not, though, the same as membership of the single market or of the customs union. The EEA I, I, I will give way. I'll just make some progress. The EEA is an internal market which is conjoined with most of the EU single market, but is nevertheless a standalone structure with its own legal, regulatory, governance and institutional frameworks. I, I will give way. Grateful. Um, does the Honourable Gentleman accept that, uh, according to the uh, President of the uh, Court he's referred to, that the uh, EEA court does in fact follow, the EFTA court does in fact follow the judgments of the European court almost exclusively. The, the EFTA court exists as a sovereign body and um, it of course takes some of its guide -like guidance from uh, the European Court of Justice but it would nevertheless, uh, were the UK to have judges on uh, the EFTA court body, uh, it, would, it would clearly have uh, extra clout and uh, the ability to exercise its sovereign right to interpret the guidelines that come from the ECJ in such a way as suits the, member the membership of the EEA and EFTA. I will give Isn't perhaps the critical thing uh, that many courts may choose to follow uh, decisions of those with similar jurisdictions? Our courts have historically done that with the jurisdiction decisions of common law courts in the past as well. But the EFTA court is institutionally separate from the, EU, from the ECJ and therefore is not subject to its direct jurisdiction. Isn't that the important distinction? I thank the honourable and, and learned member, and he has uh, uh, absolutely hit the nail on the head. What I would also <laughs> add to that point is that. Um, uh, the EU member states are required to refer uh, rulings to the European Court of Justice, whereas uh, EEA EFTA states are not required to refer rulings to the EFTA Court. This is a vitally important distinction because it has significant implications for the functioning of the two markets. Whilst the EU single market is predicated on, upon the Treaty of the European Union with its commitment to ever closer union, the EEA is governed by the EEA agreement, Article 1 of which states that the aim of the EEA is to, and I quote, promote a continuous and balanced strengthening of trade and economic relations between the contracting parties. The fundamental differences between the founding mission of the EU and the founding mission of the EEA mean that for the EU the four freedoms are indivisible, whereas for the EEA they are negotiable. And this in turn means that the EEA membership would allow a post-Brexit Britain to square the circle between market access and sovereignty when it comes to that most thorny of issues, the free movement of labour. As an EEA... I will give Gentlemen, I always enjoy listening to his arguments and I have the pleasure of serving on the European Scrutiny Committee with him. But isn't one of the difficulties with his argument this, that, that under this model we would have to follow all the rules, the rules of the single market and the rules of freedom of movement, as he's saying, without actually having a say or an input as to how those rules are made? And isn't there a risk that this is actually not fulfilling the wish of the British people? Yeah, yeah. I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his intervention, but, but I'm afraid that he's uh, misinterpreted the way in which which the EEA functions. There is the EEA Joint Committee, which sits with uh, Commission officials and officials of the European Parliament and uh, the European Council in comitology, which actually provides uh, the EEA Joint Committee with the ability to shape uh, EU legislation, regulations and directives. So the idea, I, I'll come in on to this later in my speech, but the idea that the EEA means rule taker uh, rather than rule maker is actually incorrect. 
Um, as an EEA member, the UK could unilaterally suspend the free movement of labour by triggering Article 112 of the EEA agreement, which allows for an emergency break on any of the four freedoms on the basis of economic, environmental or societal difficulties. And there is legal precedent for this. Upon entering the EEA in 1993, Liechtenstein triggered Articles 112 and 113 of the EEA agreement thus suspending the free movement of labour and ultimately agreeing a protocol that enabled the introduction of a quota-based immigration system. The manner and form of economic or societal difficulties facing the UK would of course be different, but the fact is that the legal precedent has been set, so there is no reason why the UK should not be allowed to follow suit. And having pulled that emergency break, we would then, as per Article 113, enter into deliberations with other contracting parties through the EEA Joint Committee to negotiate a lasting solution. In the case of Liechtenstein, this took the form of industry by industry quotas. I will give way. I am grateful to him for giving way, but is he really comparing Liechtenstein, which is a small mountain state in Central Europe, which frankly could get full up rather quickly? with the United Kingdom, which is a much larger state uh, and in which there is already a significant problem of migration. But it's patently ridiculous to make that sort of comparison. The comparison I was ma- the, the, this is not about comparison, it's about legal precedent. And what I, I would also argue is that um, the United Kingdom has significantly more political and diplomatic clout than such a state, and therefore the logic of his argument does not follow. He's making a very strong case, and I, I was basically going to make the same. Surely, to compare is that Liechtenstein, if it's such a tiny country and was able to achieve that, we must have some realistic chance of doing so. Yeah. yeah. The honourable gentleman has hit the nail on the head. I, I have nothing to add to that. He's absolutely right. Um, and Liechtenstein is not the only legal precedent. Article 112 safeguard measures were also invoked in 1992 by no less than four of the then seven EFTA members, namely Austria, Iceland, Switzerland and Liechtenstein, all citing the need to protect real estate, capital and labour markets. So to recap, the four freedoms operate in, in an instrumental as opposed to fundamental manner within the EEA, meaning that EEA membership offers a unique opportunity to combine market access, frictionless trade and reformed free movement of labour. Turning now to the vexed question of European Court of Justice jurisdiction. Before you move on, may, may I, can I just ask my um, honourable friend to clarify, is, am I not right in saying that currently under EU law, there, there are restrictions that can be imposed, which aren't, which namely that if somebody hasn't worked for three months, they can be excluded from a country. And thousands of people are thrown out of other countries in the EU, and Britain chooses simply not to. I thank my honourable friend for his intervention. I think this touches on the issue of what sort of reform of free movement of labour we, we think we need. And opinion is divided on this. In terms of looking at the upstream reform, then uh, the argument would be in favour of a quota based system, downstream reform based on registration. And I think that's perhaps the subject for a debate on another day. The point I am trying to make is that EEA membership enables a lot more flexibility in terms of both emergency break and uh, using industry by industry quotas. Um, Here the position is relatively simple, as EEA EFTA members are not subject to ECJ jurisdiction. The EEA is is administered by the EFTA Arbitration Court and EEA Joint Committee, and disputes are managed by the EFTA Surveillance Authority. These bodies only adjudicate on matters relating to the EEA internal market and any violations of its principles, and have far less clout than the ECJ. Moreover, while EU states courts must refer legal issues to the ECJ, EEA states are not obliged to refer them to the EFTA court. Madam Deputy Speaker, the EEA model is sometimes criticised because EEA members are cast as rule takers as opposed to rule makers. But the fact of the matter is that this criticism does not stand up to scrutiny. EEA members have the right to participate in the drawing up of EU legislation by the EU Commission, whilst the EEA Joint Committee determines which EU laws and directives are deemed relevant for the EEA and whether any adaptation is necessary. So EEA membership would in fact provide the UK with a seat at the table when EU regulations and directives are being shaped. Clearly EEA membership is one step removed from the heart of decision making in Brussels, but the reality of the referendum result is that our influence in Brussels 
and across the European capitals has and will inevitably be diminished. The only valid question now is how to maximise democratic control and influence whilst minimising economic damage. And I would contend that an EEAF-based transition deal would clearly achieve those aims. Madam Deputy Speaker, the stakes are high. I will give I'm very grateful to him for giving me I'm listening with great interest to the argument that he's setting out. Can he confirm, if I've understood correctly, that the way forward he's advocating would require the UK to rejoin EFTA? Is that the, the proposition that he's, he's making? Uh, I thank my honourable friend. Uh, um, there are a variety of views on this. Uh, Karl Baudenbacher, the uh, head of the uh, EFTA Arbitration Court, has said that the, he would favour a, a docking system whereby there could be an interim arrangement which, in a, which would put British judges on the EFTA Arbitration Court in preparation for finalising a deal. So, in a sense, a bridging uh, into the EFTA. So, but in, in my view, I, I would advocate uh, joining EFTA as part of moving into the European economic area. It, I'll make some progress, and please. And, uh, Carolyn Fairburn of the CEBI said only yesterday, we remain extremely worried and the clock, clock carries on ticking down. The result is that more and more firms are triggering their contingency plans to move jobs and investment. Reality has finally bitten, even in the minds of some of the most deluded Brexiteers that it was always a fantasy to think that it was going to be possible to complete the divorce and the final trade deals in parallel. A solid cross-party consensus on the need for a transition deal has therefore emerged, as was made clear in the Prime Minister's Florence speech. All parties in this House also agree that we must leave the EU by walking over a bridge rather than by jumping off a cliff, and the EU has welcomed the fact that the government has finally started to show some signs that it understands the realpolitik of these negotiations. So the question is not whether a transition deal is required, but what sort of transition deal we can realistically expect to strike. Both the EU and my honourable friend, the Shadow Secretary of State, have made it clear that there is simply no time for a bespoke bridging deal and that any transition deal must therefore be on the basis of an off-the-shelf arrangement. But unfortunately, the government is still in denial on this point, and the Prime Minister's Florence proposition was for a tailored transition package. No doubt the government will continue to waste precious time and energy trying to argue that a bespoke transition deal is feasible. But we all know that this posturing will eventually come to an end, and that an off-the-shelf agreement is a foregone conclusion. So having established that an off-the-shelf transition deal is inevitable, it is clear to me that EEA-EFTA is the only viable option, because the EEA and EFTA are well-established and well-understood arrangements that offer the clarity, stability and predictability that the British economy so desperately needs in these turbulent times, because transferring from the EU to the EEA and EFTA would allow us to balance sovereignty and market access, and crucially, because such a transition deal would buy us time to negotiate the final comprehensive trade and strategic partnership deal that will shape the terms of the UK's relationship with the EU for decades to come, whilst also allowing us to enter into independent trade negotiations with third countries, as we would be outside the customs union. I will give them that. Is his point not all the more um, uh, pertinent and timely in the light of the visit of the US uh, Trade Representative Wilbur Ross, who certainly seems to be implying that a US-UK trade deal will take significantly, significantly longer than the 19 months or 24 months uh, that the government are clearly hoping to, to get agreement on for a transition deal? I thank my honourable friend. I, I think there is unanimity almost around this point uh, of, of the timing. And, uh, and I would add that the benefit of, of EFTA is it's not a customs union, it's a free trade area, thus enabling us to connect into the vital market, the single EU market, but also to strike third country deals, uh, potentially also with uh, the United States. Matt, I will go back. Brother, uh, my um, honourable member, for giving way. Would you also agree with me that the United Kingdom becoming part of EFTA could, in many respects, turbocharge EFTA and make it a far more appealing organisation for trade deals to be done with? The honourable member makes an excellent point, and I think the, the current uh, EFTA members 
uh, uh, recognise the potential clout that they would have by the addition of a, a 60 million person uh, consumer market to their current market, which is a lot smaller than that. And as we know, uh, tra global trade negotiations are all about leverage and clout. Uh, I'll make some progress. And, uh... Madam Deputy Speaker, it's clear that the issues we're debating today go to the very heart of what the Brexit process is about. This debate is about the future of the people that we in this House were elected to represent. It's about their jobs, their livelihoods and their communities. And it's about the definition of our national interest and of our country's place in the world. And yet the Government claims that a separate debate and decision on membership of the EEA is not necessary. Not necessary? How can it possibly be argued that matters of such deep political, economic and constitutional significance should not be the subject of proper deliberation? How can it possibly be argued that this House should be sidelined and neutered simply because the Government is terrified of proper scrutiny? Is that really what people voted for when they voted to take back control? Madam Deputy Speaker, whilst the political case for a separate decision and debate on our membership of the EEA is unanswerable, the legal position is hotly contested. The Government argues that upon exiting the EU we will automatically exit the EEA, pointing to Article 26 of the EEA Agreement, which states that EEA members must be EU or EFTA members as well. However, it can equally be contended that the UK is an independent contracting party to the EEA Agreement, being one of the founding sovereign state signatories of that agreement and therefore exit from the EEA requires the triggering of Article 127. And I am not alone in this view. It is shared by eminent academics such as Professor George Yarrow and QCs such as Charles Marquand and others. And it should also be noted that a conclusive decision in this House that e UK membership of the EEA is not wholly contingent upon EU, EU membership would greatly strengthen our negotiating hand as the EU would be unable to force the UK out of the single market. Some will argue that this question should be settled in court, but a case in February of this year was dismissed for being premature, as the Government had yet to state their position on the EEA membership, and it was still possible at that time that the triggering of Article 127 could be wrapped up with the triggering of Article 50. So on this issue, as with so much where the Government and Brexit are concerned, we now find ourselves in a hiatus, drifting, rudderless, floating around in a mist of ambiguity and indecision. It is therefore more important than ever that this House shows some leadership. It is on the floor of this place and not in the courtroom that we should be deciding on these matters. It is we who are sovereign. On the 23rd of June 2016, the British people voted to leave the Treaty of the European Union the EEA agreement was not on the ballot paper. There is no referendum mandate for leaving the EEA. And if it had been the intention of this House that leaving the EEA be bundled in with leaving the EU, then why did this House not put that in the original statute, either in the European, European Union Referendum Act in 2015 or in the Article 50 Act? The people have not spoken, nor had the people the opportunity to speak, on EEA membership and is therefore the job of Parliament to speak and debate the matter on their behalf. Moreover, the Miller case established a legal and political precedent for parliamentary authorisation of withdrawal from any international treaty that confers rights and obligations that have been transferred into UK law. The European Economic Area Agreement clearly confers such treaty rights into domestic law. So, if we take the conclusions of the Miller case to their logical conclusion, then Parliament must have the right to debate and decide. Madam Deputy Speaker, I am truly proud of the fact that I campaigned passionately for Remain, and I will believe until my dying day that the vote to leave the EU was the greatest act of national collective harm in modern political history. However, I am also a Democrat, and I fully accept and respect the result of the referendum. The question, therefore, is not whether we must leave the EU, but rather how we should leave. And that, fundamentally, is what this debate is about. As elected representatives of the people and as patriots, our moral duty is twofold. 
We must act to ensure that the government negotiates a deal that protects jobs, livelihoods and the national interest. And we must also act to ensure that the government secures a deal that respects and enables greater sovereignty and control. Those who are driven by nationalism, separatism, dogma and ideology are not capable of securing such a deal for their only goal is to burn every bridge that they see and to re return to a bygone age of splendid isolation. And those who are driven to by a desire to rerun the referendum are similarly incapable of moving to the centre ground, which is the only place where pragmatic solutions can be found. For we know, Madam Deputy Speaker, that compromise is a sign of strength, not of weakness. We know that a country can either have frictionless trade or it can have independence, but it cannot have both. We know that Rule Britannia rhetoric provides the sugar rush of an easy soundbite, but it does not put bread on the table. All of which means that we must have a Brexit deal that puts jobs first. We must have a Brexit deal that keeps our economy as close as possible to the 500 million consumers that are right on our doorstep. And we must have a Brexit deal that holds our deeply divided country together by delivering to the greatest extent possible on the per perfectly legitimate need to reform free movement of labour. Madam Deputy Speaker, in my view, a transition deal that is based on EEA and EFTA membership will deliver the, a Brexit that protects jobs, livelihoods and the national interest. And that is why it, it is vital that this House is given the opportunity to debate and decide on whether or not Article 127 of the EEA agreement should be triggered. Madam Deputy Speaker, I therefore commend this motion to the House. Yeah. Yeah. The question is as only